we're going to resume. So, our, th our third speaker uh, is Dr. Jennifer Koblinski. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology at the Feinberg School of Medicine. Uh, her interests actually are in uh, metastasis uh, from the breast to the brain. She makes extensive use of animal models, which is, is which have been absolutely invaluable in studying metastasis. If you picked up nothing else from the first two talks, it is how complex this process is, and many aspects of this process really need to be studied in a, in a model animal system. So uh, uh, Dr. Koblinski is really one of the uh, experts at the downtown campus in uh, mouse models of metastasis, and um, she's going to talk to you a little bit about this topic. Okay, thanks. I'm not sure if you said extensive or expensive use <laughs> of animal models, but <laughs> they both are true. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk to you today about the animal models, and to, for, before I get into that, I'll talk to you a little bit about some cell culture, tissue culture models, and how they can mimic some things that are in vivo, but then why it's good to move in vivo. And as Sharon and Carol have talked to you about, oh, that's weird, well, hopefully, it's just the titles, it's okay, <laughs> the, the, um, about how it's the metastasis that kills the patient, and so I'm not going to belabor that, but I just wanted to point out to you, if a patient is um, identified with a tumor that's localized, they have a 93 to 98% chance of survival. But if, they're at, if they are diagnosed with distant metastases, they only have a 17 to 28% chance of survival. So you can see that this is, again, what is killing the patient and what we need to understand and study. And we need to have better models to um, look at metastasis. So the challenge is to find models that mimic clinically relevant metastatic disease in order to understand the mechanisms that drive metastasis and to find drug targets to inhibit metastasis and metastatic growth. So um, Sharon and Carol have kind of gone through this, so I'm going to just go through my little animation pretty quickly. But my point here is I just want to point out to you guys that, you know, the cancer is starting here for the breast and the duct, and all of the things that it's interacting with, it's interacting with the extracellular matrix, which Sharon talked about. It's um, in the basement membrane around um, it needs to invade out of. It's going to then interact with other extracellular matrix components, such as collagen, stromal cells, such as fibroblasts, fat cells in the um, breast, immune cells. And then it moves into either the vasculature, the lymph vasculature, or the blood vasculature, and there it might interact. It's going to interact with endothelial cells, platelets, and then it needs to move out and grow in the secondary site. So we need to try to look at all of these sites and think about all of these interactions and how they can affect um, metastatic growth and um, the spread of the disease. So also, um, I want to point out that certain cancers seem to metastasize to specific organs, and breast cancer has a high propensity to metastasize to the brain, lung, bone, and liver. And that's going to be, as you'll see, I go through one of the um, problems with some of our animal models is that we aren't able to look at all of these sites of metastases. Okay, so with tissue culture, this is a tool for study of animal cell biology using convenient in vitro models of cell growth. So we can mimic, try to mimic the in vivo cell behavior, such as mechanisms, cell cycle control, detection and function of growth factors and hormones. And we can study specialized cell functions, including cell-cell and cell matrix interactions, which Sharon just talked about, and invasion and migration. Um, and this allows us to have a highly selective and defined environment which is easily manipulated to study metastasis. And it's very important that we are able to look at some defined environments. But, and so the advantages are the ability to control the environment, um, the characterization of the samples, the economy. So, you know, it's economical, as I just mentioned, it's very expensive to do animal work. The scale and the mechanism, mechanization of the looking at what's going on within the cell. And we can try to 
mimic the in vivo situation as much as possible. But there's limitations. So the origin of the cell markers are not always expressed. There's lots of phenotypic characteristics typical of the tissue from which the cells have been isolated. There's genetic instability and heterogeneity and growth rate can produce variability from one passage to the next of the cells in culture. And um, I think it's really important for us to think about the difference between an in vitro 2D monolayer versus a 3D ge geometry in vivo. So, and also there is a loss of heterotypic cell-cell interactions usually in tissue culture. And there's a loss of the systemic components involved in the homostatic regulation in vivo, such as hormones. So you can, again, you can have a defined environment and add certain hormones, but you're not getting that same regulation that you would see in vivo. So um, as um, you can see, the factors affecting cell behavior in the complex in vivo environment are the local microenvironment, so the metabolite, local growth factors, the extracellular matrix, and the architecture of the tissue. And then, as again Sharon touched on, the cell-cell interactions, circulating proteins such as I just mentioned, cytokines and hormones. So we need to think about these things and what's missing when we're, when we're looking at things in tissue culture. So one way, I just wanted to point out a couple, as I mentioned, ways to look at um, some of the interactions more in vitro to look at more in vivo-like situations. So we can do three-dimensional modeling. So this is the growth of tumor cells on a 3D matrix like matrix gel or collagen 1 gels. And they can also include other cell types. So matrix gel, if you're not familiar with, is uh, extracellular basement membrane extract. So it usually contains um, collagen 4, laminins, fibronectins, so a lot of these matrix components that Sharon just talked about. And the three-dimensional modeling can affect the architecture of the cells leading to epigenetic changes. And it can be more predictive of in vivo behavior than a 2D modeling. So here's an example. Um, and this is from Mina Bissell's lab. You can see here's normal breast epithelial cells, MCF12As, and then some bre different breast cancer cell lines. You can't really see a lot of difference here in the 2D um, situation. You can see some differences in the way they're growing, but you know the, the 231s are a little more spindle shaped. Um, but you can't tell for sure which is cancer and which isn't just you know by looking at these cells. But if you grow them in a three-dimensional situation in the matrix gel, you can see that the normal cells form a round sphere, and usually they'll end up hollowing out. So you have organized nuclei, robust cell-cell adhesion, and then the the less um, metastatic cell lines, the T47Ds, they just form a mass here, and they have a disorganized nuclei, um, but they still have robust cell-cell adhesion. But if you move now all the way over here to the 231s, which we know are very invasive and metastatic, these cells are more stellate and the, more like what Carol was talking about, the EMT transition. And you can see when you put them in the 3D matrix, they form these you know, large disorganized nuclei, elongated cell bodies, and they have invasive processes. So if you move, you focus in and out of this um, 3D matrix, you can see that they've invaded into the matrix. So that's one way to, that you can look in vitro, and it suggests that these cells are going to be more likely metastatic in vivo versus these cell lines, and that is the case. So another common assay that's done is um, in vitro migration and invasion assays. There's a lot of different ways to do migration and invasion assays, and I'm just going to talk about one. But um, I'm not saying that that's the best one, but it's just to give you guys an example. And here we just have um, a filter that has th uh, three to eight micron pores, and usually for um, breast cancer cells we use eight micron pore filters. And you can see the breast cancer cells on the top of the filters and then just look at their ability to move through those pores and bind to the bottom. And that's just straight migration. If you have a coating like laminin or fibronectin, it's a very thin coating and not really clogging up the pores, so to speak, that, that people still call my, a migration assay. So they have the matrix, as Sharon was talking about, to bind to and then move through. Um, and so you can look um, at the cells that are bound to the bottom, and you can quantify this. Here we have fluorescently labeled cells, so we can use a plate reader, we can use a fluorescent scope. If you don't have fluorescently labeled cells, you can stain them with hematoxylin and painstakingly count them all. Um, but I just want to give you an example in my lab, and I'm going to give you examples throughout my talk about 
um, some of the research that we're doing, we're interested in Syndicin 1. It is a um, cell surface receptor, and it's a proteoglycan. So it is involved in cell adhesion, and Sharon talked extensively about integrins. And this molecule, Syndicin, they interact with the integrins. They also interact with growth factor, or growth factors, growth factor receptors, chemokines, and chemokine receptors. So they're very promiscuous. And we're not quite sure exactly what we're, they're doing, but we were interested in their role in breast cancer and metastasis. So we knocked down Syndicin 1 with the shRNA MER, and as a control, we have a non-silencing sequence. So you'll see this throughout my slides. This is the control on a swan, and then the Syndicin 1 knockdown. And in this migration assay, we see that there's just a slight increase in their migration. Nothing really significant. It doesn't look like a lot's going on here. If we do invasion assays, we'll coat first the filter with something like matrigel. This is going to create a gel that's clogging as I, like, kind of covering up the pores so they can't just move through the pores easily. They actually have to usually degrade it, as Sharon talked about, with proteases. And then the cells can move through and we can look at, quantify their um, invasion. And I didn't even change this, but basically we saw the same thing with invasion with the syndicin 1 knockdown cells. We didn't see much difference. So we were interested, though, in their ability to metastasize to the brain. So we thought, okay, this is, this is not, how are they getting out into the brain? What cells would they be interacting with? And in order to um, get out of the brain, the cells would have to move through the blood-brain barrier. That's one of the main ways it's thought for them to move through. And the blood-brain barrier consists of um, astrocytes, so these cells actually are surrounding the blood vessels. So we grew these on the bottom of the filter. Then we put endothelial cells on the top of the filter. Here we've used human umbilical vein endothelial cells. This isn't quite perfect since it's not really brain endothelial cells, which we now have finally been able to get some brain microvessel endothelial cells. But um, when these cells are grown together, the human umbilical vein endothelial cells actually express markers of brain endothelial cells. So that shows you that this interaction between these cells are very important. And then we can see the tumor cells now on top of this. After they've grown together for three days, we'll see the tumor cells. And you can see them growing on top of the HUVEX. And then you can look at their movement through um, the cells and the matrices here that they've laid down, and you can then count the cells that are on the bottom. And what was so interesting was that you can see that the cells that with the decreased syndicin 1 expression had a much a significant decrease in their migration through these cell types. So completely the opposite, and this is significant where the other wasn't very significant, of the migration and invasion assay. So that suggested to us that there could be a difference in the ability of these cells to metastasize to the brain and that this molecule is very important in the metastasis to the brain. So we were interested in moving to mouse models and seeing what would happen within the mice. So we wanted to think about, well, what's a good mouse model to use? And so I'm going to talk to you guys uh, about some of the different models and um, how they all have their positives and negatives. So it's, right now, a lot of people are using genetically engineered mouse models, so they call them GEMS. And these mouse models have altered expression of genes in mice and or rats, which lead to tumor formation. And they represent a more natural and vivo history of tumor development. And these are in fully immunocompetent animals. So that's very important because the immune system has been shown to be very important in tumor development and metastasis. Um, these mice also, this model systems also have altered gene expressions that can be targeted to specific organs. For example, MMTV targets expression or knockout to the mammary gland, but then it also can target to salivary glands. So you have to think about the fact that if these mice might have salivary gland tumors, you know, could some of the metastases be from, from these tumors? But, you know, that, again, that's just one negative, but there's a lot of positives to these models. So the tumors that develop maybe multifocal in origin. And so one of the big negatives of these models is that few models have 100% penetrance of tumor phenotype, and most take several months to develop tumors and longer for metastasis. So to do drug studies, it's been really d more difficult and very expensive. So you think you might, you want to make sure you have, you know, 15 mice per group. Well, when you start out, you better start out with 30 or 40 mice per group because you might only end up with 15 of them that are going to 
um, end up with tumors and metastasis. And then you have to think about how much it costs to drug all of those mice. And so that's one of the reasons why some of these models aren't as expensively used for drug studies. But they are, have been very important for um, showing us you know, how, there are, uh, how certain molecules are important in tumor growth and metastasis. And the other um, negative about these are that we don't see metastasis to all the different organs. One of the best um, models of breast cancer um, metastasis right now is the MM, or the, excuse me, the ERB2 overexpression. So these mice, um, and you might have heard about in the news, HER2 being overexpressed in 20% of breast cancer patients, and these are very, these patients have very aggressive tumors. So people have made mice that are overexpressed, HER2 in the mice, and they do indeed develop very aggressive tumors, but they usually only get metastases in the lung and the lymph nodes. So we don't see brain mets, we don't see bone mets, we don't see liver mets in these mice. So it's not a good model to look at metastases to those organs. So a very common use, in, especially during drug studies, is xenograft animal models. So this is engraftment of human tumor cells into mouse or rat immunocompromised mice. Or excuse me, the, in, in compromised model. So predictable and rapid tumor formation um, is known for these models. But the, the negative about this is the rapid growth does not mimic slower growing human cancers and may make the mouse models more sensitive to drugs. So we might ha think we have this great drug that, you know, you can cure cancer in mice, as everyone says, but can, you know, is it really going to affect the um, human cancer? So that's one of the negatives. Um, this, the positive is you are looking at human tumor growth, and that can be advantageous when you're targeting a human-specific drug or making um, antibodies to a human um, protein. So uh, the, the, a lot of people do subcutaneous tumors. They're really easy to monitor, but the negative for metastatic studies is they don't, most cells don't metastasize from these subcutaneous sites, and it's not the natural, normal environment that most of the cells should grow on unless you're looking at, um, you're injecting in the skin and looking at melanomas. So orthotopic injections, which are injections in the tissue of origin, mimic the proper tumor stromal interactions and usually have more sites of metastases. So different types of um, models that we use for the xenografts is the spontaneous metastases, which I was just talking about. The best way to do that is looking at injections in the orthotopic sites. So for example, with breast cancer cells, you would inject them in the mammary fat pad, prostate cancer into the prostate, and as I mentioned, with melanoma, you would inject in the skin. Um, I even, with Sharon and Munchie, we've done um, oral squamous carcinoma. We inject those in the tongue, or we've tried to do in the floor of the mouth. Um, so you want to try to inject them into the um, environment that they would be, they should be interacting with. And then you're going to get tumor growth, vascularization, and then the cells can invade and go through all these steps that you've already heard about today. So you're getting, you know, you're looking at the whole gamut of metastasis, growth and metastasis invasion, extravasation, and you can, you know, you can try to look at then what molecule you're interested in and could it have an effect on any of these steps. A lot of people like doing experimental metastasis, and there's benefits to that that I'll talk about in a minute, but what you do is you inject the cells into um, the bloodstream, and you can inject tail vein, um, you can inject intercarotid to look at brain metastases, you can inject intercardiac, which I'll also talk about, and then the cells are directly into the blood and then can move along, but then you're going to miss all these steps. You just have to recognize that. You're not studying these early steps. And then you can look at growth at the secondary site. You can inject the cells directly into the secondary site. So some people still call these like orthotopic injections in that breast cancer cells metastasize to the lung or they metastasize to the bone. So we can inject them in the tibia of the bone and then that's a site that they would be growing in in um, patients. So um, I should say most, a couple of these slides I took from this Nature Reviewer article. So they had a really nice um, table about the advantages and disadvantages of experimental metastases and spontaneous. So for experimental metastases, the advantages are the controlled number of cells that are delivered, 
your short time for evidence of metastatic disease, so you can get metastasis in two or three weeks and look at, you know, how your drug is affecting early on or your, your protein or gene of interest. The cell lines are available for various tumor types, so you can use syngeneic and xenograft. So that's actually nice, too, because you can here use an immunocompetent mouse. There are, um, for example, with melanoma, you can use a V16F10 cell and inject them into um, C57 black mice. That's where they arose from. So you can look at an immunocompetent system. And um, the metastatic disease can be, as I just said, targeted to specific sites. So if you inject them into the tail vein, it should mostly go to the lung, some to the liver. If you inject them intercardiac, you'll get mostly bone, brain met, maybe some lung um, metastases. And if you inject them intercarded, they're going to mostly go to the brain. So the disadvantage is it primarily generates metastasis in one tissue. So it's just the uh, flip of it. You're only getting it into one site. Um, cell lines isolated through multiple passages to enhance tissue-specific ability. So there, you know, that can be a disadvantage, I was, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. You can try to look at, this can be an advantage and disadvantage, that you can look at cells that are specifically going to certain organs, but then they've been manipulated more. Um, it's an, obviously an artificial route of delivery, and examination is limited to post-extravasation steps. So again, as I mentioned, you're missing all those early steps. Okay, so and these are the advantages of spontaneous metastasis. The metastatic spread follows natural route and mechanisms. The examination of all steps in the metastatic cascade, and there's a minimal number of passages used to isolate highly metastatic cells. And this closely resembles clinical disease, since you're injecting it into the orthotopic site and again looking at all steps. So the disadvantage is longer time needed for the metastatic disease to become evident. And I think this one's really important, the asynchronous development of the metastatic disease. So basically, a lot of the mice will develop lung metastases and lymph node metastases, and you have to stack them at that point, or I should say euthanize them at that point, <laughs> so that um, you, you, because they, they, you know, they're very sick, and so you're not going to be able to see the brain or bone mats. So that's, oops, that's, you know, one of the disadvantages. Um, and, and then if you only wanted to study one location, then, you know, so you can kind of get the idea of what I'm going through. There's, you have to just think about what it is that you want to look at and, and p figure out which is going to be the best model. And so I have the um, reference here if you guys want to look up some of these other examples. So here's just some examples of spontaneous human metastasis. So as I mentioned, like, so this in breast, with breast cancer cell lines, they, there's the MDA-231s that I've mentioned before, and they have a variant that is LM2-4. So those go to most like, mostly to the lung. And then there is some HER2 um, metastatic cell lines from the breast, and they go to the lung and lymph nodes. But you can see, again, these are not going to all the different organs that the breast cancer cells usually metastasize to. So it's nice that they're all the different types of cancers, they're, they're, they are having different sites of metastasis, like for example, colon typically does go to the liver, and these cell lines will spontaneously metastasize to the liver. So there are nice models out there. So this is um, just a slide telling you about the models that we use in our lab here, and um, so this is what I'm doing in the lab. Also Chuck Clevenger's group is doing a lot of these breast cancer um, models. Um, unfortunately, Vince Kynes has left, but he was also doing a lot of these models too, and we were all working together. Um, but so the experimental models that we're doing are the intercardiac injections, and as I mentioned, we get metastases of lymph, nose, bone, brain, lung, liver, ovaries, and the peritoneal cavity. Um, and then we do tail vein injections, and you can look at metastases to the lung and liver. And then the spontaneous metastases, which I'll show you a little bit more about in a minute, we can inject into the last tiferous duct of the fourth mammary gland, and then you can see primary tumor growth and the metastases to all these different organs. And also, I'll talk to you about in a minute, it depends on the mouse strain that you use and where you're going to see the metastases. And then um, we do some of the um, examples of growth at secondary sites, so I also can do intertibial injections and intracranial injections, <clears throat> so we can look at growth within the brain or within the bone. 
Um, other models are, um, I've helped other labs here do some colon cancer studies. So um, we orthotopically injected the cells and intersecally and they metastasized to the liver. And as I mentioned with Sharon and Munchie and actually um, Kathy Green's lab is doing more of this now. We've orthotopically injected um, oral squamous carcinoma cells into the tongue and some of these cell lines will metastasize to the lymph node and locally to the jawbone. So here's the um, orthotopic spontaneous metastasis model that we've been doing. And I borrowed this slide from Dan Toft. And 